Here's a classified ad that ran in a Toronto, Canada newspaper for someone seeking employment. Former marijuana smuggler, having successfully completed a 10-year sentence, incident-free for importing 75 tons of marijuana into the United States, I am now seeking a legal and legitimate means to support myself and my family. He then lists his business experience, owned and operated a successful fishing business, multi-vessel, one airplane, one island, and processing facility. Simultaneously owned and operated fleet of tractor-trailer trucks doing business in the western United States. During this time, I also co-owned and participated in the executive level management of 120 people worldwide in a successful pot, pot smuggling venture with revenues in excess of $100 million annually. I took responsibility for my own actions and received a 10-year sentence in the United States while others walked free for their cooperation. And finally, his attributes. I'm an expert at all levels of security. I have extensive computer skills and personable, outgoing, well-educated, reliable, clean, and sober. I have spoken in schools to thousands of kids and parent groups over the past 10 years on the consequences of choice and received public recognition from the Royal Canadian Mounted Police for community service. I am well-traveled and speak English, French, and Spanish. References available from friends, family, the U.S. District Attorney, etc. <laughs> he then lists the address where replies should be sent. This guy sure knows how to turn a sow's ear into a silk purse, doesn't he? Job listings and our reading from Romans have something in common. Let's take a look. Happy Labor Day weekend! Yay! Tomorrow we celebrate the U.S. federal holiday that's been in existence since 1894. Although now it marks the traditional end of summer and once upon a time marked the beginning of the school year. <clears throat> it began in 1882 by labor unions wanting a day off for the working man. Over the years, various customs have grown up around Labor Day. Women aren't to wear white after it. Cowboys now trade in straw hats for felt ones, and pro football and college basketball seasons begin in earnest. <laughs> From 1966 to 2014, we had Jerry Lewis's annual telethon for muscular dystrophy on Labor Day. But it all began from a street parade in New York City to celebrate the accomplishments of working men and women and to give them a day off. Many of the benefits in our work environment today came about through the blood, sweat, and tears of unions. We take for granted lunch breaks, paid vacations, eight-hour work days and 40-hour work weeks, sick leave, workplace safety standards, pensions, and a host of other benefits but each were fought for by countless workers over the past century. It was only after the U.S. Army and U.S. Marshals were sent in to stop the Pullman Railroad strike by killing 30 workers and wounding 57 others that the U.S. Congress made Labor Day a federal holiday. Labor Day is a time to pause reflect and give thanks for the legacy of working men and women we enjoy today. Labor Day weekend gives us an opportunity to reflect on our daily work and discern whether our effort is thankless and uninteresting, laboring for what doesn't satisfy, in Isaiah's words, or something that gives us deep and lasting satisfaction. Whether we're stuck in a dead-end career or soaring in our dream job. On this Labor Day weekend, we pause to reflect on the nature of work and its larger meaning in the world. We're familiar with words like career and job. 
It's often the second question asked after our name when we sit down on an airplane or meet someone new. So, what do you do? The implication is, what is your career? As we associate career with identity, as if what we do is who we are. Sometimes that's the case. Other times it isn't, but each of us is called to be someone and to do some things. Discovering these things is a lifelong process of growth and change. For Christians, there's another term for a life's work, and it's the word calling or vocation. Vocation comes from the Latin vocare or voice. When we know our vocation, we're following the voice of God and doing what we are called to do. Vocation is the work that calls us to connect our God-given gifts and passions with God's activity in the world. A vocation is a calling that merges our mission in life with God's mission on earth. As Frederick Buechner puts it in his book, Wishful Thinking, A Seeker's ABC, the place God calls you is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. We reflect on how God specifically called individuals in the Hebrew Scriptures and New Testament to do specific things or become someone new. Looking at them, we wonder how we'll know what God calls us to do. Moses had a career as a prince of Egypt, left it for a future in shepherding, and only then received a call to be a deliverer for God's people. Peter, James, and John had jobs and careers in fishing, but received a calling and vocation as disciples. Sometimes career and calling coincide. Moses shepherded the people Israel, and Peter, James, and John fished for people. In our day, we see that overlap of career and calling in the helping and healing professions. For teachers and counselors, nurses and doctors, it's more than their income. It's their identity. Doctors long past their retirement age are never simply Mrs. Smith and Mr. Jones, but remain Dr. Smith and Dr. Jones. Sometimes job and vocation coincide, but sometimes they don't. Detroit resident Doug Tenuri says, an occupation's what you do to pay the rent. A vocation's what you were always meant to do and may or may not pay the rent. My occupation is a customer service consultant. My vocation is poetry. The nuns that educated me at the little parish grade school I attended as a child would say that vocation is the work that God meant for you to do in your life. For those of us who find our occupation in one place and our vocation in another, here's a chart to distinguish those differences. A job is what I do, while a calling is who I am. A job is how I earn a living, while a calling is how I make a life. As Winston Churchill said, we make a living by what we get. We make a life by what we give. A job is what I do for pay, while a calling is what I do even without pay. A job is what I retire from, while a calling is lifelong, what I live for. A job is a human doing, while a calling is a human being. We may work in a bank, but our calling is to coach baseball. Our job might be an auto mechanic, but our vocation is to be a scout leader. Sometimes career and calling overlap. Sometimes they don't. There's more to work than just a career. There's also our calling.
God intends for our work to be much more than a job, much more than just a daily grind. It should be instead a vocation. In today's reading from Romans, Paul challenges us with these words. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. The Apostle's advice is for us to be transformed by the renewing of our minds and to be transformed by discovering what the Lord God is calling us to do. We may ask, how do I discover God's calling for my life? Author George Barna in his book, Transforming Children into Spiritual Champions, talks about instilling in kids a sense of meaning and purpose in their lives. What he says also applies to adults. Barna discusses five aspects of how to help us discover our calling or vision. The first is purpose. We come to discover that vision through a concerted time of intense prayer, vision-focused Bible study, situational analysis, self-awareness with appropriate repentance, humility, and self-confidence, and good counsel. The second is passion. One way to know if we've truly ascertained God's vision for our lives is to evaluate our passion for that calling. It should ignite tremendous energy and excitement. People who have found this vision develop a sense of urgency about getting on target. In most cases, once they gain clarity on, the t on that vision, they not only burn with zeal, but they cannot imagine devoting their life to anything else. The third is perseverance. A mark of God's purpose for our lives is there's little chance of achieving that vision and that purpose based solely on our human capabilities. We have no choice but to rely on God. Fourth is power. When we're devoted to serving God according to our calling and rely upon God for guidance and capacity, we'll experience the power and presence of God in our work. Success only comes when we submit to God's calling and allow God to work through us, in us, and around us in ways we cannot foresee or orchestrate. Fifth is pleasure. People occasionally ask how we know if we've correctly understood God's calling. One of the most recognizable means is by experiencing pleasure and joy as we engage in that calling will find a level of fulfillment unlike anything we find otherwise in our lives. Barna gives five corners to reveal our vocation, to discover our calling, to discern the will of God, and have our minds renewed. It is finding where our deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. The call of God is where the world's needs and our own joys, gifts, and interests intersect. Paul makes it very clear that we each have gifts according to the grace given to us. Some, he says, are called to leadership, some to teaching, some to exhortation, some to ministry, some to compassion. Add to this roster of spiritual gifts found in Paul's letter to the Corinthians, and we can find a vocation for just about everyone. Utterance of wisdom, utterance of knowledge, faith, gifts of healing, working of miracles, prophecy, discernment of spirits, speaking in tongues, and interpretation of tongues. We are the people of God, doing the work of God in this world. Paul calls us transformed, and we are to be transformers. To be a transformer in the world of electrical engineering is to transfer electric energy from one circuit to another. And often that, involves a, that transfer involves a change in phase, current, or voltage. The very same is true of us who are Christian transformers. As people transformed by Christ, we go into the workplace to transfer Christ's energy to the world. The turbocharging power of the risen Christ flows into the world through transformers who are busy teaching, consulting, engineering, cleaning, 
banking, or whatever. Not to be a pot smuggler, but a God smuggler, working subversively as an agent of the kingdom in the places where we work in order to perform our true vocation of ministry. Through our labors, through our labors, the Lord can be revealed. Through our careers, Jesus can be shown. Through our jobs, Christ can be seen. We are a circuit of people transforming the world through our God-given gifts. And that's a pretty good gig. In fact, it's the best job ever. Thanks be to God. Amen. If you're ready to be part of that transforming work, we would welcome you forward as we sing, Let us talents and tongues employ. Please stand as you're able. <laughs>